I think it's different than the cooling down thing. All right, so uh, real quick, for project two, uh, I checked the spreadsheet this morning, and as far as I can tell, everyone's in a group of three. Uh, so we're going to talk about skip lists today, but I encourage you to get started as soon as possible because this is, you know, there's three people in a group, but it is something that you sort of have to think through and, and you know, reason about what you're actually doing to get it to be correct. Skip lists aren't a lot of code. It's not a lot of code to actually write one. Uh, it's a little bit harder to make it concurrent, as we'll see today. Uh, but again, it's really making sure you get the ordering correctly. Um, so just real quick, some administrative stuff. So I sent an announcement yesterday that I had updated the, uh, the master branch to now include uh, sort of a separation between the test cases for the skip list and the BW tree. So now there's a single test file called skip list, skip list index test that uh, invokes the same sort of testing harness infrastructure that we have for the BW tree. So now you don't have to go muck around with the BW tree file at all. You just have a single test case that, that's for the skip list, right? And so your implementation for your skip list should have the exact same behavior as the BW tree. Meaning if we give you some input to the BW tree and produces an output, your skip list should do the exact same thing. Uh, and so this is a nice way, you know, it allows you to test to see whether your thing's actually working correctly. Uh, because we have an, a, you know, a, a reference implementation you can look at that we know is, is correct. So the other thing too is we'll be sending out information either today or tomorrow about how to get access on the, uh, the, the development machines we have dedicated for the class. Again, these are machines that MemSQL donated to us last year. Um, so these are going to be what you're going to want to use to test, test the scalability of your, of your, your implementation. Right, because these machines, I think, are they're dual sockets. Each socket has six cores with hyperthreading, so 12 cores. And so there's 24 cores available on, this machine, on these machines with like 120 gigs of RAM. So way more than you have on, on, your, on your laptop. So you can do all your development locally, but when you actually want to test your, your implementation to see whether you, you don't have any bottlenecks, uh, you'll want to use these machines. And so I think these use Emulab, so the way it works is like you, you reserve access to them. You can install whatever you want on them. And then after 24 hours, the, the machine gets wiped and restarted. So there'll be a, a directory where you can store all your files that are persisted after, re, after each refresh. Um, and, then, and then it'll be available to, to you on no matter what, what are the, which of the three machines you get. Um, but that way, if you install whatever you want and try to break the machine, it'll get, just get wiped away and restarted. So you can't, you can't cause some real damage. All right, so any questions about Project 2? Any questions about the skip list? Sort of the, at a high level, not necessarily how you actually implement it, because we'll talk about that today. But how to get started on the project? Does anyone have any questions about that? Question yes. So the question is, how much memory is on there? The question is, can you debug the, your code on this machine? Yeah, why wouldn't you? Right? You can. It has GDB, it has whatever. Right? You have root access to the machine. You'll have sudo access. You can install whatever you want. Any other questions? Right? It's not a desktop. You just, you just SSH into it. You can do whatever. Okay. Cool. All right, so for today's class, now we're going to, you know, we spent the last lecture talking about locking and latching inside of, of indexes. Um, and now we're going to be focusing on how do you actually build a latch-free index. So for today's lecture, I'm going to start off talking about T-trees, which are not a latch-free index, but I'd like to include them for historical reasons. So you see what the early in-memory indexes, in-memory database indexes look like, and you'll see why it's a bad idea and why we have better things today. Um, and then we're going to spend time talking about skip lists. Um, and talking about the basic implementation of them and how to make them concurrent. And then we'll finish off talking about some sort of implementation issues you're going to have when you want to build an index, a latch-free index in a database system. And these aren't going to be specific to the, to the skip list or the BW tree or whatever index. These are sort of high-level things that are applicable to matter, no matter what data structure you're actually using. And these are the things that you're, you're going to have to care about in, in, in your own system, in your own implementation for project number two. So again, I, T trees are an interesting uh, topic because again, I, I like sort of the history of databases. I spend all my time thinking about databases. So I like to go back and see what people did uh, in the past. And it's crazy to think like 1986 is like, what, 30 years ago? Most of you aren't even born. Uh, question? Do you, have a, do you have a question or no? Okay, all right, so uh, T trees were the first data structure that people have developed for in-memory databases in the 1980s. So um, 
the sort of first ideas about how you build in-memory database and some of the sort of design decisions you have with them sort of came out from some early research that was done by Dave DeWitt and some of his students at the University of Wisconsin in like the early 1980s. And of course, back then, the, the capacity of DRAM was quite limited, so like, you know, people actually didn't think you could actually, you couldn't actually build these and actually run them in production, right? Because you just simply did not, did not have enough DRAM. But then in the 1990s, things got a little bit better, and so now there was a bunch of implementations of these, these ideas that the Wisconsin guys came up with in actual real products that people were actually using in production. So the most famous one is Oracle times 10. Times 10 was originally called Smallbase. It was, a, uh, it was an internal project at HP Labs, and they spun it off into a, a startup uh, and they called Times 10, and then Oracle bought them in, uh, I think, 2005. And they were actually doing quite well. They're like a profitable company, but nowadays, Times 10, you can still get it, you can download it and use it, uh, but it's sort of been relegated to like maintenance mode. So Oracle tries to sell it to, sell it to you as a cache, an uh, in-memory cache for the front-end behemoth database. But most people wouldn't say, I'm building a new, you know, I'm going to build a new application and, and use times 10. We benchmarked it against our system and we can beat it, um, which is kind of sad. Uh, but it's just, you know, it's old code that people aren't really making, making better over the years. The other sort of famous in-memory database that came out around this time was uh, this thing called Dolly at AT&T Bell Labs. They eventually changed the name as Data Blitz. I think it's still around. Uh, the product page takes you to a 404 page on, on, at AT&T. Uh, I'm sure people are still using it, and like it was used a lot in like early uh, telcos. But nowadays, again, you wouldn't actually, you know, you wouldn't actually try to download and buy it and use it. So I don't know if Data Blitz is still around, but Time Ten is definitely still around. All right. So T trees were designed to be the the data structure you'd want to use if you have an in-memory database. And the key thing that a T tree would distinguish a T tree from all the other indexes that we've seen so far, and we'll see in this class and, and on on Thursday is that instead of storing the actual keys, the values of the keys in the nodes inside of the index, we're instead going to store pointers to the tuples that, that have those values. So that means that when we, want, when we actually want to determine whether, you know, if we do a lookup on a key, whether that key matches some entry in the index, we have to dereference the pointer to go to the tuple and then find the attributes and do the comparison that way. Whereas like in, the, in every other index, like a B plus tree and a skip list, you'll, you'll see that the key is actually copied in the index itself. So this is sort of roughly what a T tree looks like. So again, this looks like a uh, you know, B plus tree where we have this, uh, you know, you have this, this tree hierarchy. Uh, the key, one key difference is that the, the pointers between the different nodes are two-way. So a parent, point, parent has a pointer to its child and the child has, has a pointer to the parent. And so the actual composition of a tea tree, tea tree node looks like this. And now you could see, also see where like, the name tea tree comes from because the, the node is, is meant to look like a, like, a, like a T. So the first thing we're going to have is that we're going to have pointers to our parents and then pointers to the left and, le left and right child. And then internally, these are the data pointers to the actual tuples that have the values that are, that are indexed here. So, uh, and this will be done in, in the sorted order based on the values in the tuples. So let's say I have tuples with, you know, with ID equals one, ID equals two, ID equals three, I have three tuples. I would have pointers to those tuples and I would have to dereference them to figure out what is the actual value of the, of the key that I'm indexing here. And then to, to avoid that dereferencing over and over again, they would also, the, the only copy of a value they would store is they would have these node boundaries uh, to say here's the min and, and the max for the left and right child pointers. So, Again, the key difference here between a, a, a B plus tree is that we don't actually store the values, we store pointers to the tuples and we can derive, that, derive the values from them. And again, they did this back, back in the day because storing the values was, uh, could be expensive because you're copying stuff in, in memory, right? It's expensive to store and your, your DRAM is limited. So in the old days, these were 32-bit pointers, even 16-bit 16, 16 pointers, and that's going to be a lot smaller than you know, if you have a composite key made of a var char and some other stuff, right? So they're reducing the memory overhead uh, by just storing the pointers. Mm -hmm. So the next key difference is that the, our key space, uh, our sorted key space for the T tree is not going to be just stored directly along the leaves <coughs> as it is in a, in a B plus tree. Instead, it's going to be scattered in a uh, breath, first, breath first manner across the tree like a B tree. So if I say want to do a lookup on the range 2 to 5, I have to start at the root, 
oops, sorry, uh, start the root, traverse down into two, then go to three, and then now I have the, since the two-way pointers, I can go back to three, back up to four, and come back down here to five, right? Now, in a, in a B plus tree, you would just do one traversal down, and then scan across the leaves to find all the data that you needed. Okay, in a T tree, you have to go back and forth to find the thing that you needed, right? And again, their argument was that this was, um, this was okay to do because dereferencing a pointer, uh, it was worth the trade-off to dereference a pointer versus saving, saving uh, the memory storage overhead. So, uh, again, the advantage again, we're storing less data because we're just storing pointers to things, so that makes our, our index more compact. Um, and the, the internets are going to contain the key value pairs just like a B tree, and that makes in some cases, if, if we have to do a lookup on a, an exact key, we don't have to traverse all the way to the bottom. It may be the case that we only have to go to maybe the root or some higher level, higher level node. Uh, but obviously this has uh, big problems, right? Because otherwise, if, if it didn't have all these problems, people would still be using it, right? The, the most obvious thing is that you're, you're chasing pointers to, when any times you have to do a scan or binary search inside of a node, right? Any single time I need to say, is my key in this T tree node, I gotta go do, do a lookup on the tuple in, in memory and then look at the attributes. Um, you have to understand that the design decision they made for this uh, is different than how things are now today. So in the hardware in the 1980s, when you read the papers about uh, these early in-memory databases, they talk about how the CPU caches weren't that much faster than, than DRAM. So doing a lookup in, in, to chase a pointer to go to DRAM to find the tuple to do, do an evaluation of our key, that was not that much slower than doing a lookup in like your SRAM or, or L1, L2 cache. I don't think they had L3 back then. And then in the 90s, CPU caches got much, much faster. So now the performance difference is quite more significant. So now chasing pointers is actually a terrible idea. The other problems they have too is that it's difficult to rebalance and it's difficult to make this thing be concurrent because we have multiple pointers. And because we have the actual, the inner nodes of the index could also be, um, or actually where we're actually storing the, the values for the tuples themselves as well, the pointers to the tuples. Remember I said in a B tree, they're hard to rebalance in a, a lock-free lock or latch-free environment because if you decide to split or merge an upper level uh, node, you may having be ha also a split and merge at a lower level in, in you know, it's, it's some uh, descendant node. And so now you have two guys trying to change the structure of the index at the exact same time. And unless you take locks, it's probably impossible to do. So same thing. We'll see this when we talk about skip lists. But because we have pointers in both directions and all over the place, it's hard to make this concurrent without bringing in locks. Right? You can't do the compare and swap technique that you can do with, with a skip list or a BW tree. So again, like, as far as I know, uh, no database system, or very few database systems actually still use T-trees. The only one that I know still actually does use it is called ExtremeDB, and it's designed, it's a database system that's sort of for embedded devices where you have really constrained resources. Uh, and I don't mean like your cell phone, like your cell phone has like two gigs of RAM, so you can use SQLite on that, and SQLite uses a, a B plus tree. But I'm talking about like, you know, really low level IoT sensor kind of thing. Um, so you don't have a lot of memory. So they use T-trees. I think in times 10, I, it, I think you ask it for a tea tree, you can get it. I, I, I don't know whether that's still true or not, uh, but the default now is that you definitely get a B plus tree if, when you create an index in, in times 10. So as I said, nobody actually uses a tea tree. I'm only bringing it up to you guys so that like, if you go out in the real world and someone, you, know, you want to say, oh, I want to use a skip list, or I want to use a, a B plus tree, a BW tree for an in-memory database, and someone says, well, aren't there in-memory indexes like a tea tree, isn't that better? Now you know the answer is, is no, right? You don't, you don't want to do this, okay? So any questions about, about tea trees? I just sort of think of them as an as a, as a interesting um, uh, historical phenomenon of what people did 30 years ago. Okay, so now we want to sort of focus on the, the, the skip list stuff. So the first thing we want to sort of point out is sort of an a obvious observation that if we want to have an order preserving index in our in-memory database, and, and we want it to be dynamic, by dy that dynamic, mean, I mean that you don't know the exact number of keys that you're going to have ahead of time, right? So you need to be able to handle inserts and deletes and for some arbitrary length. The easiest way to have a dynamic order preserving index in a database is to simply use a sorted linked list, right? Like this is the dumbest thing, the most simplest thing you could actually do. 
And basically it looks like this, right? Say, you know, key one, key two, key three, all the way to key seven. We're just going to maintain as this linked list in sort of order. And that way, anytime we need to do a lookup or need to do a delete or an insert or, or update, we would just do a linear scan across the, the linked list until we find the location where we know our entry should be or we, we want to put something in. And so for each node in our linked list, it's, uh, you're going to have, uh, you know, the first part will be the key and the second part will be the 64-bit the pointer. And so you have to traverse all the pointers because we're not going to be storing this in contiguous, contiguously in memory. Remember I said it's a dynamic uh, linked list or dynamic index, so we don't know exactly the number of elements we're going to have, so therefore we can't pre-allocate an array and know how to jump to some, some offset. We always have to go across. And so in that case, the average cost, the worst average cost would be always O-N. Right? You always have to go, you know, in the worst case, go, going across the entire thing to find the last thing that you're looking for. Right, so, but this pro provides the property that we want, right? This provides a dynamic order preserving index. So is there a simple way we can make this better? What's a really simple thing we could do to make traversing this thing not so bad? You're, you're doing the hand gesture, yes. Right, so he, yeah, you're, you're jumping way ahead, but like, instead of having to go across one by one in, in our list, we can just add extra pointers that point to, uh, to every other element. So let's say I need to do a lookup and find key six. Instead of having to go from one, two, three, four, five, six, I can start at one, recognize that the thing I'm looking for is greater than key two, so I'll jump over here and get to key, th key three and do the same thing. Then I can jump to key five then I can find key six. So in that case here, going from key one to key three, I've reduced the number of evaluations and um, pointer chasing you know, by, by one. And overall, I'm you know, reducing, reducing by two. So why not just keep going up and doing this more and more? Right? So I can have now pointers to go from, instead of skipping every, every, every other, I can skip every, every, two, every four. So this one can go from key one to key five, and then from key five, we can find our, our element of key six. Right, so this is a really simple thing we can do to, to, to reduce the search time for our linked list. So this is essentially what a skip list is. Right? A skip list is going to have multiple levels of linked lists with extra pointers that's going to allow us to skip over intermediate nodes when we know the values that those intermediate nodes have are less than the thing that we're, that we're looking for. And so, the nice thing about skip lists is that it's a probabilistic data structure where we're basically going to roll the dice and figure out when we should have these extra pointers. And it's going to allow us to maintain our keys in sorted order without having to worry about any global rebalancing. Right? Because at linked list, you can always insert a new entry into it and you just have to update the pointers uh, so that the previous guy now points to you rather than your, your successor. And this doesn't require you to do the splitting and merging you would have to do in a B plus tree. So this is sort of why I'm saying this is e way easier to implement than other indexes because it's like it's a linked list. Everyone should know how to write a linked list. So again, the way to, th to think about this is that the link is we linked list at different levels. And at the very bottom, you're going to have a, uh, a a single direction linked list with all the keys that you have in your index in sorted order. And then above that, you're going to have these extra pointers, but then you're going to have links to only every other key. And then likewise, again, on the third level, you're going to have half the links that the previous level has. And you keep going down, uh, or sort of up and up and up, and at some point you don't have any more levels, and that's sort of considered like the, the root of the index. So now to insert a new key, you're basically going to flip a coin, and you, know, you, always, you always have to insert it at the lowest level, but then you decide whether you should go into the second level as well. You flip a coin. If it's tails, you don't. If it's heads, you do put add an extra pointer. Then, you, if you you get heads, flip the coin again, and if you get heads again, you can add another one. You keep going and going and going until you finally reach tails. And again, this is why it's a probabilistic data structure, because we don't have to, we have to, we don't have to know exactly ahead of time where should we have these extra pointers. We'll just randomly figure out all, over time. So the skip list is, is going to provide the uh, lookups in order of log n, I said it's approximate uh, log n because it's probabilistic, so we can't guarantee exactly we're always going to have log n, but in practice, it turns out to be, this, you know, on average, this is the case. 
So this is essentially the same thing uh, as, a, as a B plus tree, but we don't have to have that sort of tricky merge and split operations, right? We can just roll this dice and that sort of lays out the, 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 the pointers for us. So I'm gonna go through a bunch of different examples, but I first sort of sort of a visual diagram of what a skip list looks like. So whenever you see the literature, this is essentially how, every, how everyone draws them. So the first thing to point out here is that we're gonna have our level pointers. And these are sort of going to be the, the, the entry point to the first node in a particular level. And so they're also going to have also to the probability that a node will be in this level. So in this case here, the probability is always one because uh, we have to have every single key at the lowest level. Because this, like, this is like the leaf nodes of the B plus tree. We have to have this. Otherwise, it's not, you know, the key's not in there. And then above that, we have n over two. And above that, we have n over four. So again, at the bottom level, that's our sorted linked list. And now I'm here, I'm showing that for each node, we're going to have the key, it's going to have the key value pair. So key one will correspond to value one. And again, in the context of in-memory database, this is always a 64-bit pointer. And then we're going to have another 64-bit pointer to, to the next key. And as we go up here, if for these key entries at level two, they're not going to have the values. Instead, they're going to have a pointer to the, the, the node below it. In this case here, the keys always have to match. So key two here has to be the same as key two below it. And the top here, we're not going to have anything. Uh, and so what we'll do is on the, the end of the linked list, we'll have these special node markers to say that you know, this is null or nil or infinity. Like this, is, this is the stopping point. So if you, if you scan across the leaf nodes, uh, the bottom level, and you get to this point, you know that you're at the end of the linked list. So in this case here, at this top, this top level, we don't have any nodes. So when we would start and do a search, we would know that we can skip this and go down, again, go down here. All right, so let's look at an example where uh, we want to insert key five. So again, what we'll do is, we'll, we, we, this is we know this is the spot where it's going to go. So the first question we've got to figure out is, um, how many levels should we add it? So we'll flip a coin. Uh, and if we get heads, then we'll add it to level two. If we flip a coin again and we get heads again, we'll add it to level three. And say we flip, in this example, we flip it a third time, but we get tails, so we don't want to go any higher than that. So we're going to put our entry in here. And at this point, the key four still points to key six. Uh, but in our hierarchy, we have key five, this key five at level three will point to key level two, and this points to level one. So at this point here, we have allocated all our memory for, for our new entry, but we haven't updated any of the pointers to now tell everyone that this thing actually exists. So what we'll do is we'll just go, uh, we'll update all these things, and then now this thing, if anybody's sort of scanning us, it'll be able to find our, our new entry and we're done. So I'll show how we do this in, in the context of a multi-threaded environment. It does matter the order in which you add the pointers, right? You have to go sort of uh, from bottom up because you don't want someone to think that there's key five here and then sort of scan down and have it go missing. Yes. I have a question. So every time you flip a coin, you add, uh, you add, you add another uh, node in, in, the, in, the top, in the top level. So what if like, you, have, um, you have to add the, uh, the fourth level, like, to increase all the levels? So, so your question is, all right, interesting. Your, his question is, I'm adding key five. I keep flipping the coin, and every time I get heads, I go up and up and up and up. His question is, in this case here, I added an entry for key for level three, but there was no other entry in level three. His question is, do I also increase the, everyone else to go up to level three? Or even further, say I get level three and level four, do I increase the other ones? No, right? Because the order, the height of your tower, these are called towers in skip list, the height of your tower is determined at the moment you insert it. Right? You don't go back and update everyone else. Because that also too would violate the probabilistic data structure. Because then what you're saying, if you do what you're, what you're suggesting, then you don't have this nice uh, uh, reduction in the number of pointers as, as, as you go up the levels. Everyone's getting moved up. You essentially have the same skip list replicated. The same, the same bottom link list is replicated every single level. But, and that's useless. But then you mean the maximum level is fixed? His question is, is the maximum level fixed? No. It's probabilistic. Uh -oh. So yes, you, like, you could put a hard threshold and say, like, I only want to go 10 levels. But the probability that you know, you're going to flip a coin and you're going to get you know, 10 heads in a row is, is very low. So in that, the, the reading you guys had, they had this nice diagram where they show sort of the skip list as I'm showing here, but then they rotate it 
and short, make it look like a tree. That's another way to think about this. It's essentially the same thing as a B plus tree, except that instead of having everything along the leaf nodes, uh, it's sort of going down to the right side, and these higher level these higher levels are just like the guidepost to figure out where you are in in in, in the index, right? And that's why we want to have these be you have this, this prob probabilistic manner of deciding what level you add something in because we're going to have fewer entries at the top levels and that's going to allow us to do more coarse grain jumps to find the data that, that we need. Right? In this case here, like, instead of having key 1 also here, I just have key 2 and I know that if I need to go beyond key 2, I don't have to look at key 1 or anything that comes before this one. So that's why the, prob the probabilistic uh, insertion of these high nodes in the higher level helps us. It, they will have fewer pointers, they're using less memory for these things, and it still allows us to make the, make the jumps we need to to get farther along the list to, look, to, look, to find what we're looking for. <clears throat> okay, so let's look how we do a lookup. So, say we want to find key 3. Alright, so we'd start off uh, here, this is, sort of this, this is sort of the program counter, the pointer to say where, where we're at in our search. Uh, so the first thing we would do is you'd follow this pointer to the, to the node, and look at the, the key that's inside of it. So in this case here, key 3 is less than key 5, so we know we don't want to jump over here because we can only go in one direction. So anything that comes after key 5 is not going to help us because we're, we're looking for key 3. So that means we're going to go down and look at the next level. In this case here, key 3 is greater than key 2, so we know that this is the, the next place we want to jump to. But then we keep going along this level and we look to see is key 3 greater than key 4, it's not, it's less than that, so we don't want to keep going across in this level, we want to come down into the lower level. And now here we just do our linear search to find the key that, that we're looking for. I right, said so again, it looks a lot like traversing a, a B plus tree, you're sort of doing comparisons as you go down, telling you whether you want to go continue going right, or continue going, um, or at least right or left, depending on what you're looking at in that direction, or you go down. And at some point you're going to reach the lowest level and you know there's nothing, there's nothing, nothing below you and therefore you have to go across and do a linear search. Yes? Is it a single linked list or double linked list? This question is, is this a single linked list or double linked list? What, is it, what does it look like? So when you find K3 is smaller than K5, why well, just go down and go left to find when you need to start from the left of the second layer? Okay, what is your, your question is, if this, if the starting point here, yeah, well, here. Just, just to go down from K5 and uh, to scan from... Okay, from so I, I, let's say I did that. I go here, key 5. Then I come down here, key 5. Yeah. That's infinity. So I can't do that. Go left. How can I go left? Why, why, why not get, go left? How? If you make it a double link, you can make it. Right, but you can't to make it concurrent. Oh, right? wow. We'll see that in a second, but it has to be single direction because you can't do compare and swap on two memory addresses to update two pointers at the same time. But make it single list it be inefficient? His question is, if you make it sing single link, if it's single link list, does that make it inefficient? inefficient? Yes. We'll, we'll see how to solve that in a second. Um, actually, if you, I, I should have showed some posts about this. So, the, as far as I know, the only database system that uses skip list as the primary index for their, da for their database system is MemSQL. Wire Tiger uses skip lists for uh, when they bring in pages into MongoDB, but, that's, but it's not the, the main data structure. So when MemSQL came out, they had this sort of inflammatory blog post about how my, uh, MemSQL was 30 times faster than uh, MySQL, right? Because they were you know, benchmarking in memory database versus disk disc database. The, and they got a lot of flack for that. And when you read the Hacker News post, people are sort of saying like, look, you have these skip lists, but they're single direction. How can you go in reverse direction? And their initial response was, oh, you just build another, you just build another skip list that goes the other direction, right? Which defeats the whole purpose of having like this super fast or, or memory efficient data structure. We'll see in a second how you actually do reverse search when you only have single link lists. It's less efficient than just having the double link list pointers, but if you have double link list, you can't have, you can't do, you can't have a latch free index. Yes? Does skip list store the second index? Your question is, does a skip list store, uh, can you use a skip list to store non-unique indexes? Yes, we'll come to that later in the lecture. Yes. Any other questions? Okay. So, 
So the advantage of escape list is that uh, it's going to use less memory than a typical B plus tree. Um, and, and the example is part of the, the part of the reason for this is that you're not storing pointers in the reverse direction. Uh, we'll see this when we talk about the BW tree. BW tree has to maintain a whole separate mapping table for indirection, uh, and that will take some more memory. Um, sort of, the, I guess the as we'll see also too, and as you read in the reading, there's ways to have more compact skip lists by combining nodes together. The Another advantage is that insertion and deletions do not require rebalancing because you're just doing compare and swap to insert the new entry in your list. Um, and we're going to be able to, because we can do compare and swap, we can make this be latch free and have concurrent access to it quite easily. So, so now let's segue into what he was sort of, his question was like, well, why would we have to have a single linked list or why is the skip list in a single direction? And again, we're going to use compare and swap to allow us to do this in a latch free manner. So let's go back to this insert key five example here. So we know we're going to put it in here. So when I first cr allocate the nodes for key five, right, I flip the coin. I know I was going to go up to level three. I'm going to allocate the memory, insert my key value pairs, and have the other nodes in my tower. But at this point, key four in, in this here is still pointing to key six. This key four is still pointing to infinity, and then our our head pointer for the, the beginning of the uh, level three is still pointing to infinity. So again, we've allocated our memory, we have our key value already, but nobody knows about this yet. So now we want to be now we want to do compare and swap to insert this into the index and make this be available. So again, we still have all our pointers down the tower. So what we're going to do is we're going to go from the bottom top, or from the bottom going up, and we're going to do a compare and swap instruction to change the key that comes before us to now change the pointer to be from key 6 now to key 5, right? And what will happen is the compare and swap instruction, we're going to say, we know that we, we thought that the old value for this pointer here was key 6. So do compare and swap. If it's still key 6, we know that we're the thread that's going to win the race to get to change the thing. And then update it now to be key 5. So if the compare and swap fails, then you know some other thread has come in and inserted something between key 4 and key 6 before you could. So then you have to come back and try it again. Right? But you can do this without ever requiring latches or locks. And the compare and swap instruction is super cheap because, again, it's a single instruction to do this. So it's not like we had to lock the node with a mutex or a, or a spin lock and then update all our pointers. Now this is why it has to be single, uh, single direction because you can't do a compare and swap to now point this guy and in this direction, this guy in this direction, at the same time. Because there are going to be two different locations in memory. And you can't do that in, in a single instruction. Because otherwise you've got to bring in a spin lock to protect both these guys, then, do, then, then you know, flip the pointers, and then unlock them. And that's going to be really slow. Yes? Isn't this two compare and swap operations? Her statement is, is th isn't this two compare and swap operations? For what? One to connect K4 to K5, and the other one from K5 to K6. Okay, see, I, I should have drawn this, I should have been more careful about this. So th here, this doesn't need to be compare and swap because nobody knows this about it yet. There's nothing pointing to this K5. So the thread that's inserting this entry is the only thing that knows about this. So go ahead and can set this, this pointer here. Right? What if some other thread comes and deletes, tries to delete K6? Itself? We'll see how, we'll, how to handle deletes in a second. Uh, so her statement, her question is, what if someone deletes K6? There's, delete, there's logical delete and physical delete. We won't allow physical deletes, but we'll allow logical deletes. Next slide, you'll, you'll see how this works. So now, at this point here, K5 points to K6, and, uh, and I can I guess, update all these other ones as well. But at this point here, I can now do my compare and swap. I only have to update this one location. Key 4 now knows about K Key 5, so if someone's scanning along the leaves, they're going to find our, our Key 5. Now, if someone has, has scanned past Key 4 to that Key 6, then we do our compare and swap. They're not going to see us. That's okay, right? Because there's, that's, there's some high-level level construct about you're checking for phantoms that would know, would know how to rectify this. From the purpose of the index, that's fine. That's still considered correct. So then now we go up to the tower and we keep doing the same thing. We, do, we update this pointer here, then do a compare and swap, update here and do a compare and swap. So now if you get to these higher level ones, if the compare and swap fails, uh, you, just keep, you, can, you can keep retrying it without having to go back and, and redo this one. Because right? this thing's still always going to point to this. And that's, that's okay. Because if someone else came and inserted something in here, and they beat us, we beat them to update key 4, 
but then they, for this, this level, and then they beat us to update this K4, uh, that's still, the, 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 the physical structure of the index is still correct. Because we would still be in front of them here, or they, they, they would insert in front of us here, but we still have maintaining the correctness of our linked list here, and then we need to rectify that as we go up to the lower levels. So if you do the compare and swap at the higher levels and they fail, you just retry it. Right? You don't, go, you don't undo the thing you did here. Okay? So that's sort of clear. Again, single direction, you do single compare and swap at each level, and you, you, that's enough to make sure that, that you, the integrity of the index is correct. Yes? So d does this mean you can't do what, what the paper suggested, um, or what, what the blog post suggested with, um, with a single node with an array of pointers, one for each level? So his statement is, is this, does this mean you cannot do what they suggest in the, in the, in the, the blog article about you can have a single array uh, per node with multiple pointers. That's still okay. Because you're updating the, um, you update the lower pointer at the lower level. Okay, you, 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 you do one time. And the same, the same logic applies. That, like, if, if you fail at the lower, higher levels, you would just retry it. Okay. Yes? Um, like, if I fail to gain from K4 to K5, should I redo the search to find what key is for me? Yeah, so his, state, his question is, if I fail to do this, if I, if I am not able to insert key 4 into key 5, do I have to redo the search? I think the answer is yes. Right, because you don't know how to get back to where you were. You know that something else came in. So you do another search, you figure out where you, you want to be, then you, you retry it. No question? Same question? Okay, good point though. Um, so now you kind of see what I was saying before. Like, it's super easy to make a skip list if it's not concurrent. Then we start adding in uh, these atomic insertions and deletions, and things get a little more tricky. It's still not super hard it's in terms of the amount of code you have to write, because again, a single compare and swap is one instruction, right? One command. It's making sure you get the order correct is, 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 is the tricky part. All right, so let's do the example that she, she asked about doing deletions. So the way we're gonna do deletions in our skip list is we're gonna do it in two phases. The first thing, the first phase we're gonna do is we're gonna logically delete the key from the index by setting a flag inside the node that tells the other threads that are running in, in, you know, in the index at the same time, ignore this entry. It's still there, it's still being pointed to by other nodes, it's just as you scan and come across, you check the flag, and, and if it's set to be deleted, you know to, to ignore it. Then what'll happen is, at some later point, we'll go and physically remove the key once we know that no other thread could be possibly holding a reference to our deleted node. And we'll talk about how we do this in the garbage collection phase uh, later in the class. But again, to now physically delete it, it's just another compare and swap to take it out of the list and, and then, then throw it away. But again, we want to be careful that we only do the physical delete once we know, know the thread is running at the same time, or could, could be touching it. All right, so let's say this one, we want to, we want to delete the key five that we just, we just inserted. So again, for all, in all the leaf nodes, now we're gonna have a, a little flag, a Boolean flag that says whether this node has been deleted or not. And this just, this is an 8-bit, or sorry, 8-bit eight, eight, yeah, eight bool for this. So let's say now we want to delete key 5. So we would do our search going across, we would find our entry here, and then flip this, this, this thing to be true. And it can only go in one direction, it can only be, um, it can only be uh, set to delete, you can't undelete it. If someone tries to then come back and insert the same key after it's been marked for deleted, you, just, you create a new entry for it. Right? So you don't have to do this in a compare and swap because if someone does it, it right at the moment you do it too, it always goes to true, so it, it doesn't matter. So then at some later point, once we know that no other thread is, is looking at this guy, and we'll do this through the garbage collection mechanism later on, uh, we can go ahead and do compare and swap to now remove these pointers. Um, I take it back. We can change these pointers, yeah, we change these pointers with compare and swap going from the top down uh, to now point to the entry that comes around it. So now at this point here, a thread could still be sitting here looking at us, um, so we need to make sure that, that, that they're gone when we actually finally do the free and remove it. But it's safe for us to go ahead and do the compare and swap and update these pointers. And the same thing, if you do the, do the compare and swap and somebody else has come in and updated the, the pointer before we did, like if they inserted the new entry in here, we need to maybe do the search again and find where we should actually be, be pointing, or find the thing that's actually pointing to us and make sure we get rid of it. 
Yes. I have a question about how do you find any other nodes that are pointing to the dividend? And you always, his question is how do you find any other nodes that are pointing to it? Well, you're always going to go in. You just, yeah, that's you, like a linear search. No, because you start at the top again and you, you and log in to traverse where you need to be. Oh. Yeah. And you don't, you only care about what the leaf node is that's pointing to it. Oh. You know that the only thing pointing to you in, in, in your tower is yourself. And you know this thing's being deleted, so you don't have to worry about you know, making sure these guys go away. All right, so again, at here, at this point here, in this, when I'm showing this diagram at this, at this point in time, we still have key five in our tower, but all the other pointers now go around it. So we know that no one can, could, could possibly traverse and, and find us. But again, because we're a, lo a lock-free or latch-free data structure, there could be a thread sitting here for whatever reason, that, and we need to make sure that we, we, it's gone before we can go ahead and reclaim it. In the back, yes. Her question is, does it matter whether we physically delete the node from top down or bottom down? Yeah. So this is okay. Why, why, do, why would that matter? Because uh, if you insert the node, you have to like, insert from the bottom to the top. And, uh, you, don't, you, you update pointers. Yeah, it's, 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 semantically, yes. You insert from the, from the bottom to the top. But you're talking about physical deletion or logical deletion? All right, physical deletion... What did I just say? We'll talk about this more about when we do a garbage collection. Physical deletion, I said that we, do, we physically re free this memory when we know no other thread could be referencing it. So if no other thread could be, could be referencing either of these blocks, it, 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 doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter. Let me think about whether that's true or not. Uh, actually, no. It, it, you are correct. Actually, yes. So you could, yes, she's actually correct. So you could have a thread here, and it traverses here, and then no, at the point we want to delete this, ah, actually, no, I'll explain this in a second. Yeah, the, the issue is that you could have a thread here, and then recognize that no thread could be touching, uh, no thread could be touching this thing, so I want to go ahead and physically delete it, but then this guy is pointing to it, so I traverse the pointer, and I would, it was set fault because you're pointing to nothing. When we do epoch-based garbage collection, we'll see why that, like, that cannot happen. So it, I would say it does not matter, as long as you do garbage collection correctly. So when you fish this node, and another thread is creating this value, so does it Physical delete or logical delete? Logical delete. Alright, some, some of the thread is reading that value. Okay. Like, so, so, so you, her, state, her question is, I marked this as deleted. So let's go back here. We're back here. We haven't physically deleted it. We still have pointers. Our thread got to it. Marked this as deleted. Your question is, if I have another thread, is at this node at the same time, and they, they check to see whether deletion, delete value is true. It's not. Then I do the read. But actually, before I do the read, then the thing gets flipped to be true. It still reads it. Is that okay? Is that your question? Well, let's talk it through. Like, like, why, why would that be bad? Why would that be good or bad? Um, so, the left thread can still read that value. It, it can, yes. I think, the, like, so it's, yes. But, like, is it, it's, it, I'm quite, my question to you is, like, is that a bad thing? So, the other thread don't care about the sound of the or not. They do, but, like, <sighs> Think again, the index is part of this larger organism, the database system. The database system has all this concurrency goal stuff that we talked about before. So, I mean, I don't want to get into linearizability, but this is, that's okay because we're still seeing things like, it's still correct from the index's point of view. It's incorrect from the transaction's point of view, but that's outside the scope of the index. The index only knows how to make sure that you don't screw up the data structure uh, as you make modifications with concurrent threads. Whether the operations or the, 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 the answers you're getting from the index, whether they're correct or not, is left to the concurrency control scheme up above in the database system. So yes, in your example, if I have a transaction comes in, I, it, it, you have two threads for two different transactions. They both get to key five. The first thread checks whether delete is true, and they say, hey, before we get to there, it's false. So then it goes ahead, and before it reads, 
value 5, the other thread marks it as true. So technically, yes, it should not be able to read that, but it read this you know, before it got that. So it's like this is the classic ABA problem. But that's okay from the index's point of view. Because otherwise you have to, what, you, set, you have to set a lock on the node when you flip this bit and make sure nobody, nobody comes along. But like, the index doesn't care. And the upper levels of the system, we'll, you know, we, we can do the, fa the phantom checking to make sure whether we read the thing we're actually supposed to read. So that's outside the scope of, of, of the index. Let's go question. Yes? So when you said it is a uh, latch free, do you mean the parent and the square that would belong to latch? Your question is, uh, when I say this is a latch tree index, that the comparison swap don't belong to what? Sorry? Latch. It is not a kind of latch. His question is, is the comparison swap operation on the pointers, is that equivalent to a latch? Yeah. No, right? Like, think of latch as like a traditional OS mutex to, pre pre to protect some critical region. It's not the same thing at all. We're just, we're flipping, a, we're fl you know, if we're flipping a bit, to store, or flipping a bunch of bytes to store our new pointer, uh, it's not like we have to like flip a flag uh, to acquire the latch, then we can flip the pointer. It's one on top operation to, to do that, so it's considered lock free. In the back, yes? So, is this process uh, the logical delay? Is it logical delay? His question is, at this, when I'm showing the example here, is this considered logical delay? Yes. Okay. Physically, it's still there. There's a little flag that says, you can't, logically, you're not allowed to read this. Okay, so then I have, I have another question, which is when I delete this node, another thread goes, uh, it, assume it is doing a scan and it goes to this node, and I just like delete the pointer to the next node, then the other thread, how, how could it get back into the. So your question is, all right, when you say you know, delete, you're saying logical delete or physical delete? Uh, logical. All right, logical delete. Uh, first thread comes along, he flips that bit, right? Now logically it's deleted, but I still have all my pointers. Scan guy comes, another thread comes along and scans, he'll see key five and sees the flag that it's deleted and he knows he should ignore it. And so if it's doing a look up on key five, it would say, oh, it's not actually here, delete, or it's because it's deleted and, and say no, or it just keeps going and scans, scans, keeps, keeps the scan going. So the pointer is the, is the Yeah, so the, yeah, correct, yeah, I should have not shown, uh, yeah, I should not show this. This is actually incorrect, you're right. You have to still maintain the pointer to this. Later on, you, when you reclaim it, you, you always maintain this pointer. But, but now, like say, uh, I say, I insert key 5.5, you have to have some logic, like, and that should go here, you have to have some logic to know that, well, I should really be updating maybe key four to now point to my new one instead of key five. Okay, key, it, I don't think it actually matters. Yes? So when you do the physical delete, yes. um, do you have to make sure that all the other nodes that point to uh, this deleted node, like on different levels, have to be done uh, at the same time? So, in my example here, when I show I'm updating pointers, yeah, I mean, updating the like, top level pointing to the end and second level pointing to... Yeah, your, your question is what, sorry? Like, uh, so you're updating the pointers, right, in a different place. Yep. So, do they have to be done at the same time on different levels? Your question is, when I do the update here, when I say, so this key four here and key four here, is that a pointing to key five? I want to now go around them and point to the yep. next, next thing. All three of them have to be done at the same time. When you say in the same time, what do you mean by that? Like atomically? Yeah, atomically. How are you going to do that? How, how can you? If you can't do that, how do you make sure that, like, if there are other searches going on at the same time, how do you make sure that? All right, so, the, so his question is, how, how can I update three pointers without having a, a latch and still, I can't do it atomically and have it still actually be correct? Well, let's say if I just do the first one, right? The first one, I can do a compare and swap on this guy yeah. to go around it. At this point here, I mean, again, I, these things should not be removed yet, right? No, it, so yeah, what if at this time there, there's another thread like searching at the second level? Yeah. And it came across, like, Key five, right? Yeah. That's fine, okay. right? Because it, it can't go that direction. It can only go this direction. And at this point here, we've only updated this one pointer. Oh. 
So every, they're still semantically correct. So this, this brings up, a really, I mean, the way you guys are reasoning through this, and I, and I like this, but like, this is what I was sort of saying about like, you need to write test cases to make sure the, the, the structural integrity of your skip list is correct. Right? That you don't have things pointing to garbage, you don't have things pointing you know, in, 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 a, in a loop to each other in a cycle. Right? And these are not test cases we can provide you because this depends on how you actually implement your index. So these are the sort of things you're going to want to do in, in your project implementation to make sure that maybe there's a function you call that just does, you know, freezes the skip list and makes sure that the pointers are, are, are in, the, you know, in the correct order and pointing to the correct things. Okay? All right, so I, I want to keep going because, you know, we're low in time. There's a bunch of other stuff I want to talk about. All right, so again, uh, this is just reiterating everything I said before. It's, you got to be careful how you order your operations. And then a very important concept also, too, is that the, when, it, when the database management system, the upper level of the database system invokes your index, on, the operation can never fail. And what I mean by that, it's different than a, in a transaction where if, you, if the application executes, executes a query, the database system can come back and say, your transaction failed because there was a conflict. In your index, that can never happen. You can't come back to the, to the database system and say, yeah, no, I can't do this for you, right? Because the compare and swap failed. So you're going to have to retry your operations until you actually succeed, right? If you do a compare and swap because you're trying to update things and it fails, then you come back and try it again. And eventually, it should, it should succeed. If it, if, you, if, it, you know, if it fails forever, just because there's so much contention, well, there's, you know, there's, from the index point of view, there's nothing, nothing you can do to prevent that. Right? There's just, just too much work trying to be done. So this is an important concept. So whether you, you implement this retry um, logic in the index wrapper itself, or in the, uh, the, the data structure. Remember, we provide you the sort of, the, there's the skip list index, and that's the, the higher level API. And then there's the skip list data structure implementation, and that's where you actually put your, the, the pointers and all the things we're talking about here. Wherever you, whether you put that retry logic directly in the wrapper or in the, actual, in the, in the data structure itself, it's up to you. So this, this last point is important, right? Again, if I say insert, if the compare and swap fails because someone else changed the pointer before I could, I can't come back to the database system and say I failed. I have to try it again, over and over again. And eventually it'll succeed. Okay? All right, so what are the bad things about skip lists? So uh, as you saw in the blog post, he talks about how invoking the random number generator can be expensive, especially if you have a, you know, um, you're trying to build a high performance index. And this is because the way pseudo random number generators are implemented is that there's a state machine inside of it. So every time you call rand, you update the state machine and that can be expensive. They're also not cache friendly because you're chasing all these pointers uh, and you know, for every single uh, you know, fetch on a cache line to go grab a node, you're only getting one key value pair, right? Where and compare this to the B, B tree or B plus tree, I can just scan across the leaf nodes and I get all of my key value pairs that way. And eventually I, I have to you know, follow a pointer to go to the next node, but again, I'm bringing in a lot of data with, 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 with a single load operation. And then, as we'll see in a second, the load the reverse search is not trivial. So again, the paper you guys you guys read, or the blog post you guys read, was again was I, my opinion was a nice sort of introduction to say here's how to actually make a skip list uh, work well in practice. So we'll see this on the on the um, when we read the BW tree for Thursday, they compare against a skip list. I don't know how um, you know how optimal their skip list actually was, but you'll see the BW tree is going to going to crush the skip list. Um, the, there's newer versions of skip list that came out last year. Uh, there's a multi-core one, multi one from Alan Fecky in Australia that instead of using towers, they use wheels. Uh, that you don't have to implement for your project, but there are, there, there's better ver implementations of skip lists uh, that are coming out in, in recent years. But in general, the skip lists are considered to be slower. All right, so the optimizations that we talked about, we can reduce the number of random invocations by having that, uh, that bit shifting operation he showed. I tried to test it out in, uh, in Python last night, and it, it appears to work. Uh, we can pack multiple keys in a node. We can do reverse iteration with a stack, which is not in the blog post. We'll just describe how to do it. And then we can reuse nodes with, with a memory pool. So I'll talk quickly about how to combine nodes, or combine keys into multiple nodes. So again, instead of having these nodes just have a single key value pair with pointers, we actually can combine them to have a single node with a bunch of slots, and then just have one pointer to, to the next entry here. So ideally, what you want your node, your node size to be is to fit into a cache line. 
cache line is what? Uh, 64 bytes. So in this example here, assuming I have 32-bit keys and 64-bit uh, value pointers, uh, so I would have, in this case here, I could have four slots. So that would be, what, four times four, so that's 16 bytes for my keys. And then I would have uh, what, 24. So I would have 56, or sorry, I would have 48 for the key value pair, 48 bytes for the key value pairs, and then a 64-bit pointer, 64-bit pointer, which is eight bytes for the pointer to the next node. So that would be 56 bytes to store this node with four entries in it. And that can fit into a cache line. So now when we do a single load, it's one fetch operation to go get the thing we need to DRAM and put it into our CPU cache. And this is why packing them together is much, much faster. So now to do an insert, rather than keeping this in sorted order, uh, we'll just find whatever the free slot we have and just put it there. So in this case here, we have this, the last entry is our free slot, so we'll go ahead and just insert it. So now what happens when we want to do a, a search we have to do a linear, linear search inside of our, our node. But again, in this example here, it's only four elements. I said it, this will fit in a cache line, so this is hanging around in L1, and this will be super fast to do. All right, this is, this, again, this is way better than having jump from, from node to node to node. The downside, obviously, is that if now I want to insert something like key five, that should go in between key four and key six, so now I need to do a split and copy some bytes out, right? But the trade-off is that you know, it, it may not occur that often, and, or relative to uh, the cost of doing that split is be less than having to traverse all the pointers all the time. So you, you get a benefit of this. You, this. This gives you a performance benefit. Um, the other downside too, also too, is like you could have wasted space because you have to pre-allocate this memory. So you could you could have sort of half half full or less than half full uh, nodes because you have to maintain all these free slots. So again, th I. I this would be interesting if you guys implement this to try to measure see what the performance benefit you can get from it. Yes? If you want to put that book in memory uh, in a cache line, uh, you basically have to properly align your... So, 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 yeah. so his statement is, if you want to put this in a cache line, you have to make sure that it's properly aligned. Yes. We will talk about how to do word alignment next week. Um, well, yes. I, we'll, we'll, talk about this. we'll talk about this again later. Okay, uh, to do reverse search, again, because we're in single, 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 we have a single, single direction linked list, we can't just go jump to the end and try to go back. So, if you read the MemSQL blog post about skip lists, they have a real small paragraph to talk about how, how they do reverse search. Um, and it's not really clear exactly what, what they're doing. Uh, so the link here is actually to a, a, another reference implementation on GitHub from somebody else who implements the reverse search I'm going to show you using a stack. Now when I asked uh, the guy that used to be the VP engineering at MemSQL, because he, he was CMU alum, and he was a guest speaker with us last year, I asked him, like, look, this is how I think it should be done with a stack. He's like, oh, no, no, we, we actually don't use the stack. Uh, they use extra pointers at the end. So I don't know exactly how the MemSQL guys do this. The blog article is not clear, but it, for, for your implementation, you should probably look at, look at the algorithm that the guy shows here. All right, so for this, we want to find the range of key four to key two, inclusive, but in, in descending order. So we'll start off here at the very top. And what we want to do is we, we know that our uh, lower bound for our range is key, 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 key two. So we want, to find, we want to find where K2 starts. So the same thing as before, we, we do a lookup, K2 is less than K5. So we want to go down to the next level. Here, K2 equals K2. So we can jump here. And then we know immediately we, we can go down because we have an exact match. We actually don't even need to do this comparison here. So we jump down here, and then now we're at the leaf level, we're at the, the, lowest, uh, the lowest level in the skip list. So now what we want to do is now maintain a stack of the entries we see as we scan across the bottom. Right? So in this case here, we would go from K2 to K3, and then finally to K4. And now when we want to return to the database system, the the, the, our range in the proper sorting order, we just pop these off the stack, and that gives us the, the reverse search we, we, we wanted. Is that clear? So this is sort of something you, you would maintain the stack possibly inside the index implementation itself, the data structure, but then in the logic inside the wrapper, you would say, oh, I, I know I have a, uh, I know I want to take the, 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 the keys that I saw and just reverse them, and that's how I, I generate my output. So the wrapper is what, where you would implement the logic to reverse, reverse the stack. Again, this allows to do reverse search without having uh, back pointers. 
นะไอ้ cool All right, so now I want to talk about some additional implementation issues that you're going to have when you build an index. And again, I'm, these are not specific to uh, to a skip list. You're going to have these same issues no matter you know you know what data structure you're using. So for these first two, the memory pools and garbage collection, I'm going to focus on how you actually do these techniques in the context of a lock for your lat tree data structure. For these other ones, the non-unique keys, the variable length keys. Um, I'll talk about composite keys on, on Thursday. These have nothing to do with, with, with being lock free. These are just how you organize things in memory. But these first two, again, these are what you need to do in a, in a lock. These are the way you're going to do this in a, in a lock free index. All right, so obviously in our index, we don't want to be calling malloc and free all the time, right? Because that's going to be slow. Um, that means every single time we want to physically delete or physically add a new node into our index, we don't want to call malloc. Every time we free it, we don't want to, you know, call free. So what we're going to want to do is we're going to use a memory pool. And the idea is that if we know that the nodes are the same size or, or within the same size category, then we're going to maintain a pool of available nodes that we've pre-allocated in our index. And that when someone wants to insert, a thread wants to insert a new node, we look in our pool and find one free node we can use and use that for, for the thing that we're inserting. And if we don't have any more free, 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 free nodes, we just call malloc and, and, and allocate it for us. Right? And the, guy, the idea is that when we do delete, rather than again freeing it and returning the memory back to the operating system, we'll just go back and put it into our pool so that some other thread can come along and use it. Now you see why it's important to make sure that you do the, the physical delete it, only when you know threads are not looking at your, your, your node. Because if I delete it and it gets added back to the free pool, but some other thread is still looking at it. When I go back, another thread comes back right away and inserts it, they'll start putting in new values, and now you're going to have something super crazy, like completely incorrect, right? The, the integrity of the data structure is, is, is still correct because you're not reading invalid uh, you know, addresses in memory, but now some other thread has come along and it's inserting things that, that shouldn't be there. The other thing you'd be mindful of in your implementation for Project 2 is that you're going to need some policy to decide when you want to retract the pool. Right, so let's say I have an example where I load uh, a billion key, key value pairs and then I delete all the billion. If I don't retract my pool size, then I'm always going to maintain this giant allocated space for one billion keys. But I'm never going to go pack, put, put them back in. Right, so you're going to need some kind of threshold to decide, well, if I know, for example, my, the size of my index is twice as small than the, the number of free slots I have in my memory pool, let me go ahead and retract that. Yes? So when you do the recapture, you also have to move those around in order to create a contiguous space. Yeah, so his, his question is, it's a question or a statement? It's a question. That yeah. Would be very so his question is, if I retract the size of the memory pool, am I going to have to um, go around and reorganize... Uh, reduce fragmentation. Reduce and, and reorganize things in memory. Yes. Uh, so, you know, how you avoid this could be the policy you would use when you, when you hand out things in the memory pool, right? Rather than just randomly picking at anything, try to always pick one that, that's, that was, you know, it, you know, in a block of memory that's, been, that's being used a lot. Right? The simplest thing you could do is just for every single node you allocate, just call malloc for that. So then when you, can, when you free it, you know that it's not part of some contiguous space, you just, you just give it up. Right? That's the most naive thing to do. To do proper compaction is, is, is more complicated, and we're not going to talk, talk about that here. You know, we have the same problem with MVCC as well, right? If you delete tuples and if you delete old versions, you could have like a block that has like just one version that's actually still available and all this other free space. And you want to reclaim it, but now you need to move things around. You have to update pointers to, to the locations in memory because you move things around. So compaction is, is, is more tricky. I would say just do something simple for your, for your implementation. Okay, that's a good point, though. I mean, again, I hope you're kind of seeing that, like, you know, we now we talk about garbage collection, but like, the index is kind of like a mini database system in, in itself, right? We're caring about latches, we're we care about concurrency with different threads, we care about garbage collection and memory pools, right? And this is all going inside the index, and all the sort of same kind of stuff is occurring outside the index, inside the database system itself, right? So you're like, the index is an awesome project, because like. 
in my opinion, because like you're sort of building a mini, mini database. Because you care about a lot of the same things that the database system cares about inside the index. Right? So garbage collection is another example. So as I said, we can logically delete safely by setting that flag to know that if anybody comes across and reads our entry, they shouldn't be able to you know, use it. But now at some point we, we need to be able to, to, to free our memory. And again, this could be putting the, the, you know, calling free and giving back the memory to the operating system or putting it back into our memory pool. So there's a lot of different techniques you can use. Uh, this is a well-studied problem for in, in latch-free or lock-free indexes. So I'm going to focus on the first two here, reference counting and epoch-based reclamation. But you know, if you take in like 418 or, or 213 in other classes, right, there's hazard pointers, there's thread scans, there's a whole bunch of other techniques you can use. And again, the problem we're trying to solve is like this, right? So my thread is doing a scan across the leaf nodes or the, the, the lowest level, and some other thread comes along and deletes this guy. And if we go ahead and free the memory right away, then this guy would still think this thing points to it, and it would jump to that location of memory and get a seg fault because it's, it's reading invalid memory. So we need a way to, to, to ensure that no other thread could be you know, coming across and trying to find our guy uh, if, if we actually free the memory up. So the, the most naive way to do this is to call reference counting. And the idea, idea is that we're going to maintain a counter for every single node to keep track of the number of threads that are accessing it at any point in time. So any time before you can access a uh, before you can access a node, you in increment the counter by one to, to to tell everyone that you're actually involved in you know you're reading it, and then when you're done, you go ahead and you move it along to the next node. You go ahead and decrement the counter, right? And the garbage collection mechanism of your index will know that it's safe to delete that node when that counter finally reaches zero, right? This is really simple to do, uh, and you can use atomic addition essentially compare and swap to update these, these counters um, atomically. So this is actually gives you really bad performance though for multi-core CPUs. And for the same reason we saw that the sort of naive spin lock or sp spin lock latch was, was, was giving you bad performance because now you have all these different threads trying to update these, uh, these, these shared counters for these nodes and that's going to cause a lot of cache coherence traffic. Um, in, in the system. So if you're scanning along the leaf nodes, as you scan, you know, I keep saying leaf nodes, but you know what I mean, the lowest level. As you scan along the lowest level, you keep incrementing or decrementing these counters as you go from one node to the next. That's going to be a lot of cache coherence traffic to invalidate the cache, the cache lines for that counter at all different cores as, as they scan across. So the reference counting gives, is, gives you bad performance. And it's still technically lock free, but it's sort of essentially the same thing as a spin latch because you're, you're, you're flipping this counter to let everyone know that you're inside this critical region. So, uh, just two observations we can make about reference counting. The first is that we actually don't care about the real, the, you know, the actual value of, of the counter at any point in time. Right? I don't need to know that it's one versus two versus three. All I need to know is that it's just not zero. Right? And so, with that, we also don't have to go delete the node immediately when the counter reaches zero. We actually can defer it to some later point once we know that no other thread could be touching it. So again, when I show the example of, of the packing the multiple key value pairs in a single node, that, you know, I say what, that was a single cache line, so that was what, six, you know, 64 kilobytes, I didn't know that, 64 bytes, thank you. Uh, so if I delay the deletion of 64 bytes, that's not really that big of a deal. So it's not like when I assume like the counter reaches zero, I immediately have to go free it up to, to, to save space, right? I can kind of delay it and let it let and do it at a later point when I know it's safe. So this is what Epoch Garbage Collection gives you. So the idea is that there's going to be a global epoch counter that keep that is periodically updated by some some thread, which thread it doesn't matter. And you do this like every 10 milliseconds, you just update this logical counter by one. Right? We saw this also too with the, in the silo paper, right? They had this, this epoch thread that's updating things every, every 40 milliseconds. But now we're doing this inside of our index. We're doing it every 10 milliseconds. And the idea is that we're going to need to keep track of what threads enter the index at any given, at, at a particular, at our current epoch, and then when they leave. So, this is sort of the thing that's like you, you enter the index when you invoke the, you know, the skip list index wrapper and then you exit the index when, when you leave that. And so you would know that when I enter it, it's, current epoch is 10, 
and I keep track of it. Here's all the threads that I know that are in, that are in my epoch. This is why, another reason why you can't have go-to statements, right? Because it'd be really bad to have like someone enter the, the, the index and you mark it in the current epoch and then you jump to some other location in memory and come back and try to enter it again, right? That would, that would, the semantics of that would, would be quite weird, right? So, and then what will happen is when one of these threads says, all right, I, this, this node has been deleted, logically, you'll mark the epoch, the current epoch for that node uh, of when, the, when it was logically deleted. And then the garbage collector will, will decide that when it's safe to reclaim that node, once all the threads have left the epoch that the, no that the node was deleted at, and all preceding epochs have no other threads in them as well. And this will guarantee that no other thread could be looking at the node that, you, that, that you're dealing with that you want to reclaim. Um, and there's no pointers to it that's going to cause any problems. And this avoids this, having this, this, this shared counter at every single node. You, all you need to do is just update this thing every 10 milliseconds, which is not that big of a deal. And then you just keep track of you know, setting that epoch on the node when it gets deleted. So this is also called, in, in, this is another example of like in the operating system world, they, they're basically, it's the same concept as what we use in databases, but they call it something different. So in operating systems, this technique, this epoch-based garbage collection is also called read, read copy update, or RCU. Uh, and this is used heavily inside of the, um, in, the, in the Linux kernel. So this is sort of clear, right? We just have a global counter. When a thread enters, we, we mark that it entered at that epoch, and then we know that when it leaves, and then any time we delete a node, we just have to set, set its little epoch flag to say, this is the current epoch when this one was deleted. And when no other, threat, no other thread could be inside our current epoch, and any epoch that came before us, because right, this thing's updating every 10 milliseconds, regardless of whether threads have exited the epoch or not. So we know there's no other threads coming in, in, you know, in, in the prior ones, then it's safe to delete. We know that nobody else could be, could be looking at it to cause problems. In the back, yes? But this is logical deletion, right? This is physical deletion. When you mark the current epoch. Yeah, so yeah, he's, yeah, so yeah, his statement is, yes, when you, this part here, when you mark the current epoch, this is, this is the logical deletion. So instead of setting the Boolean flag, say true or false, you set this flag to say, this is the epoch when this thing's being, being deleted. And then as you scan across, you check that flag, and if it's not, not you know, if it's non-zero, non then it's the same thing as the flag being set to true. So that's the logical piece. And the physical piece is when you come back and scan and, and find all the, the, the nodes where the, the epoch is, is set to true, and you know there's no other threads in that epoch or any epoch preceding that, then you can physically delete it. But uh, in later point, the thread can also assess the logical deleted node. Say it again, at a later point, the thread can, can what, sorry? Can also assess the, this logical deleted node. Uh, uh, what's, uh, I'm missing the verb there, sorry, say it again. Uh, like in skip list, yes. you mark it as a logical deleted Yes, yes. And in the later point, the thread can also assess this logical deleted You say reset? Assess. Assess, I mean read it. Yeah, read it. Yeah, so that's fine. But but now the threads uh, read this, this node. Yeah. The epoch number is, is smaller than the current thread, so... Ah, uh, yeah, I understand. This has nothing to do with versioning. This is like, the epoch is like, have I been deleted? Then stamp it, done, deleted. You don't care about what epoch you're in when you read it, because that this has nothing to do with versioning information. This is not multi-versioning. It's just, am I deleted or not? Again, this is what I was saying. It's like it's a mini database inside of the index, but we're not doing multi-versioning. It's it's you know it's, it's sing, single instance, a single version. Okay. Uh, so real quick, the things you got to finish up. So I. Uh, for non-unique indexes, there's two things we have to deal with: non-unique indexes and variable length uh, keys. For this one, you have to handle for variable length keys. We, we already handled this for you in the, um, in the, in the implementation. So the two ways to handle non-unique indexes. The first is you allow for duplicate keys. Um, you basically have multiple key value pairs where so they all have the same key. Or you can have a value list where you store the key only once and then have a pointer to a linked list for all the additional values of it. So for this, I'll just use the B plus tree leaf node as an example. So there's a bunch of extra, extra metadata at the top that we can ignore. 
the thing we care about is here. So in this example here, I have, I have two arrays. One is for the keys in sorted order, and one for all the values. And the values, again, are pointers to the actual tuples. So in this case here, I have key one. It's replicated three times. And for each of these, they're going to point to some offset. Or so I, I know the offset for my key in, the, in this sorted array, and that'll correspond to the offset of my, my value for this entry here. So I'm wasting more memory because I'm storing the key multiple times, but I don't have to have actually extra pointers to where the actual values are. Because I just know if I'm at position three for this, for this key, I could jump to position three in the, in the, in the value list, and that, that finds the value that I want. The other approach is to use value lists. So now in my, in my sorted key array, I'm only storing each duplicate key once. And instead, they're going to have a pointer now to a linked list where it'll have all the values that correspond to that particular key here. So you'll see this when you implement the delete operation uh, in your index. We provide you the key value pair. Because you can have duplicate keys, when you want to delete, say, key one that has been duplicated multiple times, you also have to check all the values to make sure you're deleting the right one. Because if you just delete the entire key, you'll, you'll, you'll delete the things that shouldn't have been, de been deleted. So in practice, I think everyone implements the, the duplicate key implementation. This is how we do it in the BW tree. Um, and the reason is because, yes, you store less memory, uh, you can, you can st you're storing the key less time, less, less, number, less multiple times, it just makes this thing way more complicated because now you have these variable length lists and that makes the nodes possibly a variable length and just makes ev everything more complicated, right? Because now if you want to reuse your nodes in your memory pool, you have basically have to use like a slab allocator technique where you have, you know, here's all the one kilobyte nodes, here's the two kilobyte nodes and, and know how to organize things that way. So in practice, I think everyone does it the duplicate key pro way. All right, and then the last thing we've got to discuss is how to deal with variable length keys. So the first approach is actually you don't store the keys at all in, in, the, in the index, and you just store pointers to the tuples, and you have to do the lookup to find the attributes that you need. All right, we saw this in the T tree, and we said this was probably a bad idea. The next thing you can have, you can have variable length nodes. So you, have a, you store the, the sort of key array as a, as a linked list, and the, different, in the inner nodes of the linked list can have different sizes. And again, you have the same problem that I just mentioned before with the value list where now your nodes can have different sizes and that makes managing memory more, more difficult. Another naive approach is just to do padding, right? So if you know that like your key is a varchar32 and even though most of your keys are, you know, are only have 16 characters, you just pad it out to always be 32 so that everything is, is nicely byte aligned and the node sizes are always the same. But obviously the downside of this is that you waste space. And the last one is you key, a key map where you're actually going to store uh, pointers to the key value pairs in, inside of the, the node itself. So here for the, key value, for the key map, I'll have an array and these pointers correspond to a, a sort of list like this and whatever data structure you want to use, it doesn't matter. But usually the first element will be the actual key and then the subsequent elements will be the values. Right? So I, I want to think in our system, we, we store to sort, use the first approach, but we don't actually point to the tuple itself. We point to a, um, a byte array allocated in the heap of that, that contains the actual value. So we can actually support SCD strings natively because they provide us the move semantics to, to avoid having to copy the string multiple times when we want to you know, reshuffle things. Uh, but the idea here is that we're, not, we're pointing to a heap that's owned by the index and not owned by anybody else. So it's okay that we have a pointer uh, because we don't worry about having to share with, with any other thread or any, any other data structure. Um, but in practice, I think most indexes are going to be on fixed length attributes, right? So it's, it's, not, it's, not, that big, it's not that big of a problem. Okay, so uh, what are the party thoughts? So again, I said this multiple times during the lecture today, but basically managing a, a lock-free concurrent index is a lot like managing a database system, right? a database itself. We have, con like, we have concurrency control, we have uh, garbage collection, we have memory management, um, but it's sort of done as, sort of, as, a, as a microcosm inside of the, the, larger, the larger database system. And as I said, the skip list is really easy to implement. Uh, you read various blog posts about skip lists, they'll say you can implement it in, in 300 lines or less. Uh, I've never you know, fully implemented it all the way, so I don't know whether that's true or not. But the, 
as we saw, in order to do, uh, allow multiple threads access the index, having a concurrent skip list is more tricky because we have to make sure we get things in the right order. And then I finish up showing the epic garbage collection scheme, and that's going to be more cache friendly than, um, than sort of reference counting. So the other things that I'll say to you real quickly about the, how garbage collection will be done in project two, you don't have to do cooperative garbage collection, meaning the threads, the threads, as the threads scan the index and do whatever the normal operations, you don't have to worry about them doing the garbage collection. There's a separate function called perform GC that will then invoke with a, with a completely different thread periodically that will go ahead and uh, the, you can then use to do whatever the garbage collection is that you want to do. Um, so when we do the scale up test cases, we'll invoke that, we'll invoke that, um, you know, I, I don't know the exact number, maybe every 50 milliseconds or something like that. But there's also another function called needs garbage collection uh, that you return true or false. If you, if you know that there's nothing to garbage collect at, at this time, then you can do a quick check and return false when we invoke that method to tell us not to have our scan come and invoke perform GC. Right, think about this in a, in a real system. If I have a table where, uh, you know, in the, in the last minute, I haven't done any updates to, to it, and therefore I haven't updated in indexes. I don't want to keep invoking the garbage collection uh, component over and over again. Okay? Any questions? All right, so next class, we'll talk more about OTP indexes, and we'll spend most of our time talking about the, the lock free BW tree from Microsoft, and we'll spend some time talking about the, the art index from the hyper guys. And then in the remaining time, I'll do a sort of quick overview of crash course on how to do performance testing uh, with your skipless invitation. So I'll show you how to use call grind, and I'll show you how to use perf. Okay, and I'll assume you guys know how to use GDB because it was, it was in the prereqs. Okay? <laughs>